Welcome, everyone. My name is Ted O'Connell. I'm one of the authors of Crush Step 1, the ultimate USMLE Step 1 review. This is the second edition of the book, and we're going through it chapter by chapter. This is part one of the cardiology chapter. We're going to start with the heart and blood vessels. The heart is responsible for pumping oxygen and nutrient-rich blood to all the organs. If at any point in a person's life the heart stops doing this for more than a few minutes, irreversible organ damage can result. The heart, blood, and blood vessels make up the cardiovascular system. The heart has four chambers that blood flows through, right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, and left ventricle. It is important to understand the path that the blood takes through these chambers of the heart to understand how problems with each of these chambers will lead to symptoms. Each time blood leaves a ventricle, blood is leaving the heart through an artery. Therefore, arteries such as the aorta and pulmonary artery take blood away from the heart. Veins, such as the superior and inferior vena cava, return blood back to the heart. Each time blood flows from an atrium to a ventricle, or from a ventricle to an artery, blood passes through a valve, which, if working correctly, ensures that blood flows only in the correct direction. Studying the following steps of blood flow within, with the image of the circulatory system provided in figure 8-1. First, after the body's tissues and organs have taken up the oxygen from the blood and delivered their metabolic waste to the bloodstream, deoxygenated blood returns to the heart through the superior and inferior vena cava to the right atrium. Two, from the right atrium, the blood travels through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. Three, from the right ventricle, the blood travels through the pulmonic valve to the pulmonary arteries which travels away from the heart to the lungs to drop off all the CO2, a product of aerobic metabolism in tissues, as well as replenish the oxygen supply in the blood. Four, after gas exchange in the lung occurs, the oxygenated blood returns to the left atrium through the pulmonary veins. Five, from the left atrium, the blood travels to the left ventricle through the mitral valve, also known as the bicuspid valve. 6. From the left ventricle, the blood travels to the aorta through the aortic valve to be distributed to the tissues, and the cycle repeats. Now let's talk about the anatomy of the heart. The heart has three layers, from inside to out, the endocardium, myocardium, and epicardium. The endocardium is a single layer of endothelial cells that envelops the inside of the heart, including the valves, similar to the endothelial cells that line blood vessels. This is important in terms of talking about ischemia of the heart, which can either be transmural across all layers of the heart, including the endocardium, or subendocardial, just affecting the endocardium, as well as in infective endocarditis, which is an infection that takes hold at the endothelium covering the heart valves. The myocardium is the thick striated muscle layer of the heart that is responsible for the pumping activity of the heart. These muscles are perfused by coronary arteries, and in a myocardial infarction, or heart attack, the death of parts of cardiac muscle can cause the heart to fail. The epicardium is actually the visceral pericardium, which will be discussed next. The heart is surrounded by a pericardium, a double-walled sac that has a serosal visceral, or inner layer, and a fibrous parietal outer layer. Between the visceral and parietal pericardium, there exists a minute amount of pericardial fluid, which allows the heart to beat with minimal friction, similar to how a car uses oil to decrease friction between moving parts. This becomes important clinically with pericarditis, which is inflammation of the pericardium, usually due to infection, uremia, or autoimmune disease. It is also important in pericardial effusion and tamponade, when too much fluid builds up between the two layers and can even act to strangle the heart if enough fluid and pressure builds up such that the heart's ability to fill with blood is impeded. This is tamponade. The heart relies on an electrical conduction system to ensure rapid, coordinated contraction of the heart. The sinoatrial node, the pacemaker of the heart, which sets the normal heart rate by generating electrical signals. These electrical signals depolarize the atria and are conducted to the AV node. The atrioventricular or AV node, named because it lies between the atria and ventricles. 
In the normal heart, this area is the only place where the electrical signal can be transmitted to the ventricles through the bundle of Hiss, which further branches into the left and right bundle branches. Malfunction of the AV node and bundle of Hiss leads to various types of AV block, or heart block, which are described later. Left bundle branch. This is responsible for coordinated contraction of the left ventricle. If these fibers are damaged and lose conducting ability, a left bundle branch block results. Although too detailed for the purposes of step one, the left bundle further separates into the anterior, posterior, and septal branches, and blockages of these can lead to anterior fascicular block or posterior fascicular block. The right bundle branch is responsible for coordinated contraction of the right ventricle. It can be damaged and lead to a right bundle branch block, although a right bundle branch block can be normal in some individuals. The coronary arteries are responsible for perfusion of the heart. Narrowing, such as caused by atherosclerosis, and blockage of these vessels can lead to angina or chest pain or myocardial infarction. The left and right coronary arteries come off the aorta at the aortic valve cusps. The left coronary artery divides into the left anterior descending artery, which supplies the anterior left ventricle, and the circumflex artery, which supplies the lateral and posterior left ventricle. The left anterior descending artery is the most commonly occluded vessel in patients with myocardial infarction. The right coronary artery supplies the right ventricle. In 85% of people, the posterior descending artery comes off the right coronary artery, which perfuses the inferior and posterior ventricles. This is called right dominant circulation. In the remainder of individuals, the posterior descending artery comes off the circumflex, or both the circumflex and right coronary artery. When it comes off the circumflex, this is called left dominant, and when it comes off both the circumflex and right coronary artery, this is called co-dominant. The right coronary artery also supplies the sinoatrial node and AV node, which can lead to arrhythmias and heart block if damaged. Now let's discuss the anatomy of the circulatory system. The circulatory system can be divided into two components, the pulmonary circulation and the systemic circulation. The pulmonary circulation is made up of the right heart, pulmonary arteries, capillaries feeding the lungs, and pulmonary veins. It is responsible for taking deoxygenated blood from the right heart to the lungs for oxygenation and then moving the newly oxygenated blood to the left heart so that it may be pumped into the systemic circulation. The systemic circulation is made up of the left heart, systemic arteries, capillaries, and veins. The systemic circulation is everything outside of the pulmonary circulation. The goal of this circulation is to take oxygenated blood to the body to deliver oxygen and nutrients and return that newly deoxygenated blood to the right heart. The circulatory system uses arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, and veins. Each serves a different purpose. The arteries are thick-walled because they receive blood from ventricles and therefore must, with, must withstand large changes in pressure. Examples include the pulmonary artery and aorta. The arteries have three layers, starting at the inside layer called the intima, which has a single layer of endothelial cells. The media, a thick, elastic, and muscular layer, and the adventitia, the outer layer which houses the vasa vasorum, or vessel of vessels, blood vessels that nourish the artery itself, as well as nerves and lymphatics. Arterioles are the site of highest resistance to blood flow and are regulated by alpha-1 receptors for constriction and beta-2 receptors for dilation of their smooth muscle, helping the body regulate distribution of, various, of blood to various organs. Capillaries have a single layer of endothelial cells, allowing for diffusion and exchange of gases, fluid, and nutrients between the blood and tissues. The amount of fluid exchange that occurs is dictated by starling forces, which describe the net driving force for fluid to come into or out of capillaries. The starling forces are determined by the hydrostatic pressure and the oncotic pressure of both the capillaries 
and the interstitium that surrounds them. The oncotic pressure is the osmotic pressure derived from proteins that cannot traverse the capillary interstitium interface. The oncotic pressure of the capillaries is mainly determined by albumin, the main plasma protein. Low albumin or hypoalbuminemia, therefore, causes decreased capillary oncotic pressure and can promote fluid moving from capillary to interstitium as the osmotic drive keeping fluid in the capillary is lost. Thus, hypoalbuminemia can cause edema. Hydrostatic pressure is simply the pressure exerted by the fluid. P net equals the forces promoting fluid capilla leaving the capillary minus forces promoting fluid returning to the capillary. There is an equation, P net, which equals the hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries plus the interstitial oncotic pressure minus the sum of the hydrostatic pressure in, in the interstitium plus the capillary oncotic pressure. Next, the venules and veins are also thin-walled because they are meant to be capacitance vessels, meaning that they can hold a large amount of blood. The veins, like the arteries, have three layers, intima, media, and adventitia, but have a thin, non-muscular media. Sympathetic tone can cause these veins to constrict, promoting venous return back to the heart to assist in increasing cardiac output. Veins have one-way valves that help ensure that blood can return to the heart even in the face of gravity. That's the end of this section. In the next, we will discuss physiology.